Do you want to know the secrets of how to sell to the C-suite? Then keep watching. This episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Adrian Davis. He is a selling expert. On today's show, he's sharing how we can sell to the C-suite. We dive into when you should be dealing with the C-suite, how you should communicate with them, the notes you should be taking, which is fascinating to me, of how you can take notes on metaphors, on the metrics that are being used, so that when you come to the proposal stage, you include them, you pull on emotions, and you win the deal. You can find out more about Adrian over at adriandavis.com. His book, Human to Human Selling, is available on amazon.com. And with all that said, let's jump in to today's show. Adrian, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Great, thanks so much, Will. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you on. We're gonna dive into a topic today, which you can have legit just no no messing around, no faffing, just legit straight value for a whole bunch of the audience, which includes me in my medical advice days of selling to the C-suite, selling to CFOs and people of that nature. And I always felt uncomfortable. I always felt like I shouldn't be there. So hopefully we can uh, resolve some of these issues and, and enable the audience and myself to communicate better with these individuals moving forward. Um, but first, before we dive into how to communicate better with the C-suite when we're in the room with them, when we're in the office we're or in the phone or however we're communicating, when should we be dealing with them? And is it always a priority to get in front of the C-suite or, you know, in 2017 in, in complex B2B sales, do we need to be in front of them all the time? Oh, wonderful question. And what I would say is in principle, yes with some provisos. I mean, it depends on the size of the corporation that we're selling to. I work with some clients that are selling to really large corporations, some of the largest corporations uh, on the earth, really. Um, and for them to get in front of a, a CEO or even a C-level executive, it's next to impossible. But if we define the C-suite as the true economic buyer, they can get in front of a president, they can get in front of a, a group uh, vice president. And for them, that is like the CEO, the, 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 the economic buyer for their type of sale. But, you know, with smaller, midsize or even large corporations, uh, we can still get in front of the C-level executives. And in principle, we should. And so I think that was the, the question that you had. Or was there another question embedded in there? Uh, the, there was probably about 15 questions. I've got a habit of doing that. <laughs> but that is great context. And this is what I wanted to yeah. start the show with of so for me i do a lot of business with salesforce the chances of me getting anywhere near the c-suite of salesforce with what i'm doing uh, well it's never going to happen unless i happen to bump into uh mark benioff, benioff or you know someone on that level just in a in a lift in the offices or something like that so i i thought that was important to to clear up that because uh, especially if you're new and you're doing email outreach you might be spamming out emails to the c-suite of a company like that when surely the director, the VP levels are the people that we should be targeting, perhaps. With C-level executives, we never want to be spamming out emails. They're not going to respond to broadcast emails. Uh, but I think even in the case say you do a lot of work with Salesforce and you're not necessarily going to get in front of Mark, uh, but I think understanding how Mark thinks, what Mark's priorities are, how he is uh, orienting and directing the corporation, all of that is critical. So, so uh, connecting with the high level strategies and thoughts and goals and objectives of the CEO are important to you, regardless of which level of executive you actually end up connecting with. Why is it important? I, I think I've got an idea, but I wanna hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, of why do we need to know these top level, uh, these top level strategies when we're dealing perhaps the level below that on a more practitioner level? So, because that's where our value is. We're, we're in this, uh, I like to say that we're um, in this environment now where there's, there's this division between what I call the fast food uh, salesperson and the gourmet salesperson. And the, the person who's selling fast food is commoditized. And so they need to understand they're selling a commodity and, and so they need to be the cheapest, fastest, uh, prettiest, and, and just get in there and, you know, dance as fast as you can, hope they'll <laughs> like you, and uh, it's a race to the bottom. Uh, but some people can win if they know exactly what they're doing. They're, they're in a corporation that understands where a commodity will always be a commodity. We're just gonna be the best commodity and the cheapest we can be. Where we can win is on the gourmet side. And this is where we get in, we really understand the corporation that we're selling to, we understand the executives in the corporation. It's not what we sell that has value. Where, where our value comes from, Will, is, is 
the perception of the buyer. And, and that's going to come from the gap between where they are and where they're trying to get to. And to the extent that we can help them get where they're trying to go, that has, that, that's where the value comes from. And so the gourmet provider gets in, understands exactly what's going on inside this organization, exactly where the organization is trying to go, and then paints a picture, provides a bridge of how to get from where you are to where you want to go. And that's what gets people excited and that's where the value is. Simply showing up and talking about my stuff uh, is not going to create value or excitement uh, for these executives. Okay, so we, um, we can continue with the Salesforce example or we can move away from this perhaps, but we I know that I want to pitch Salesforce sponsor the show essentially um, for anyone who's watching it on the or listening to it on the audio, it's less obvious. Anyone who's watching it on the video, there's a big Salesforce mug here. There's I think I was on this side. There's a Salesforce or be on this side. There's a Salesforce banner that pops up every um, every few minutes, and so let's use this as an example because I think this would be useful and the guys at Salesforce will like that we're diving into it as well. They'll be intrigued. So I, I've i got no access to Mark to get inside his head to see what his corporate vision is for the next five years. And I'm selling down from the the kind of VPs are signing off what I'm doing, um, but I'm not in t- particularly in direct contact with them. I'm in the kind of direct level before that. How do I translate what Oh, no, I guess there's two steps to this. Uh, so I'll phrase it in two questions. One, how do I know what Mark wants so either I can pitch it from the bottom up and you know get, present my product, my service, the audience um, towards the longer term concepts, goals and, and aspirations as a business? And so that's one, how do I know what's in Mark's head? And then two, how do I pitch that upwards to someone who's further down the food chain who's still a senior you know, professional within the organization, but they probably have slightly different goals than what the organization has, if that makes sense. Yes, that does make sense. And what I'd say is the first place for us to start would be the annual report for Salesforce. Mark is gonna communicate in that report specifically in the letter to the shareholders, uh, the, the state of affairs, You know, where we are today, what challenges we faced, and the path that we're on, we're, we're, what we're building toward tomorrow. He's also going to state in that letter the key strategic initiatives that the organization is focused on. And that's where I would start. And, and basically what I often recommend to uh, salespeople is to read that letter to the, the first time you read it, read it backwards. So start at the last paragraph and read a paragraph at a time, but go backwards because then you're not going to get sucked into the marketing genius of the people <laughs> who sit down and, and sort of craft these letters. <laughs> And, and so the shareholders are reading this and it's just couched in such a way that it just feels so good. And even in the middle, when the bad news is presented, it's not as harsh and it's not as dramatic as it should be because of how it's been couched. But if you read it backwards, a paragraph at a time, Will, you don't get caught up in the emotional uh, roller coaster or the emotional manipulation of the letter. And what you're looking for as you're reading it is A, what are they trying to accomplish? And B, what's getting in their way, and then finally see what are the strategic initiatives that they're embarking on uh, in in order to address these challenges that are getting in the way. So that's what what I'd be looking for there. You know, what's their, what what is the stated mission as well? There's things on on the website that we can look at. Once I've got that, um, then I'm going to do some additional research, look at maybe the 10K. Uh, Also, a guy like Mark is going to give lots of speeches. So, you know, you can track him down, track, download his uh, speeches and presentations, etc. So you can do that research and just get a really good understanding. Now, once you've got that, uh, what we need to understand is everybody, and I don't know how many uh, employees Salesforce has now. Do you, have a, do you have a sense of how many tens of thousands of Tens of thousands, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so they've got tens of thousands of people working for them. But what we need to understand is every single person that is employed by Salesforce is employed ultimately to help them achieve their strategic objectives. And if they're not moving the ball forward or moving the needle and helping the organization get to its strategic objectives, they're unnecessary, Uh, they're fat, they can be cut. And so when we talk to the whatever level of executives we're actually connecting with, or hopefully a little bit higher than we would normally, uh, we need to make sure that they understand that we know what the strategic objectives of the organization are, and we have an understanding of their role 
in fulfilling that those mandates. Now, that's number one. But number two, you mentioned something else, Will, and that is that they may have their own personal goals and objectives. And it's critical for us to understand that as well. So for every stakeholder that we are engaging with, we have to really understand two things. What is the organization trying to accomplish strategically? How do they plug into that? But then also, what's their personal agenda? And we need to help them win on both sides. And is this just a, so this is going to be a super simple question, but I think there's dramatic implications to it. Is this as simple as saying, you know, I, you go into the conversation leading with, I understand this, and this is the initiative for this year, and this is the goal for the next three years within the marketplace to you know, consolidate or to, to acquire other companies and, and, and all this good stuff that comes from the, the very highest level. How do we go about asking them what the personal objectives are? Because their personal objectives might be, I don't really care about the role. I'm only here for 18 months to smash some targets to move on to somewhere else. How do we how do we approach someone and, and pull that out of them without essentially lying them back in a chair and doing a psychotherapy session and, <laughs> and, and trying to uncover their like desires? If only we could do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say you know first of all we keep it on a on a professional level, keep it on on the strategic level. I mean I have a, a actual um, dialogue that a process that I've developed uh, for selling to C level executives or those that are just below. And uh, just a way, by way of an acronym, acronym, I call it a sale. If you, know, you want to make a big sale, just think a sale. Um, a is for amenity. Uh, where you just start with one or two questions to build comfort, to create to create a, a comfortable space, a we space where you and I, you know, um, we just chit chat a little bit, a little bit of small talk, and we get comfortable with each other. And that is absolutely critical, especially when meeting with uh, senior executives, because. You know, the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind is constantly under threat. And whenever we meet somebody new, that threat response is heightened. And so we need time to just get people comfortable in our presence and get that unconscious mind feeling like, okay, this is a friend, it's not a foe. This person is here to help, they're not here to harm. Uh, so I call these amenity questions, you know, a uh, little bit of sort of small talk, which has big implications. Then, rather than go straight to the problem that we're trying to solve, I highly recommend that we talk at a, what I call strategic context or ask strategic context questions. So here we're just asking exactly as you had said, Will, about these strategic contexts. I, I'm going to say a little bit about what I understand, about what the corporation is trying to accomplish, and then I'm going to pose some questions to them to help fill in the blanks. Uh, and, I, and I love to uh, ask these questions if possible comparatively. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these executives, they meet with uh, vendors all the time and they have their, a lot of their answers will are rehearsed. And so when they, when they're giving you a rehearsed answer, they're not thinking they're on autopilot and the, and the meaning is not valuable to them. You can change that. Or one of the quickest ways we can change that is just by making questions comparative. So if I'm asking about sort of the key competitors that they're concerned about that might interfere with their ability to achieve some of their objectives, rather than just ask that question, which other salespeople might ask and get the same answer that other salespeople might get, I can change it up simply by making the question comparative. And, and to do that, all I need to say is, you know, let's say I'm talking about the top three competitors and how are they different than say three or five years ago? Oh, yeah. and, and just by putting that comparative twist on the question, now they have to stop. They can't just give me a road answer. They need to go back in time three to five years ago and think, okay, who were we, who were we concerned about then? Who are we concerned about now? And, and why the difference? So that's strategic context. Once we've done that, then we can come to attention focusing. And that's the, what the A stands for, where we focus their attention on an area of the business where we know we can help, where we believe that there's going to be a gap and that that gap is, is an area that we can fill. And this is where, as we're starting to explore this, uh, we are trying to see, understand the problem that we can solve. This is more short term. The strategic uh, context is longer term. Uh, attention focusing is shorter term. Uh, and it's around where they're challenged and what threats they're facing. L stands for linkage. And this is where we get them now to link the problem area to the strategic context. So whatever these strategic objectives are, now that we've understood the gap and the problem in the short term that they're facing, the magic of the linkage question 
is to get them to to connect the dots. So we just asked a simple question, well, you know, how does this problem area that we've just been discussing, how does it connect to what we were talking earlier about your strategic objective of, you know, what are they say they want to be first in all the markets that they compete in? Let's say it was that. I don't answer this question. I ask them to answer the question. And this is a critical, critical uh, experience that they're going to have where they're going to re they they'll answer the question, they'll find an answer. And as they're answering it, they're beginning to realize the strategic nature of the short term problem. And that's where there's real value now in solving this problem and they begin to prioritize it. And the, the final question is envisioning. Uh, we then get them to envision what the future would be like if we could solve this problem and they could, you could have the ideal solution. I find that once they've gone through this process, the level of trust between the salesperson and the executive jumps significantly. Inside of half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, uh, they feel so much rapport, like here's somebody who gets me, who understands what's important strategically, who's helped me think through the challenges that we're facing in the short term, has helped me realize the strategic implications of these problems, and has even helped me envision a solution. It's after we've gone through this process and there's a real professional rapport that that would then open the door for us to, to then go a little bit below the covers and say, you know, what does this mean to you personally? Uh, how does how do you benefit from uh, solving this problem personally? How can I best help you, in other words? And also we want to explore at the same time, what are the negative implications to you of not solving this problem? And and But we can only really go to the personal side after we've addressed this uh, professional side and built professional trust. There's just, I think there's a subtlety here that I want to just clarify, because it could go either way and still be ethical and fine and, and work. But are we asking questions that we don't know the answers to and then building, painting a picture with them actively in the moment? Or are we asking questions that perhaps we do know the answers to and those answers lead to our product and we're almost funneling someone down a pathway, if that makes sense? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. And, and so fundamentally, we are asking intelligent questions. We are engaging in authentic conversation. And we don't know the answer to the questions that, that we're asking. Uh, so, you know, a lawyer will say, you know, never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Uh, but in this case, these are truly exploratory questions. Now, what's different today and again, when we talk about this sort of fast food salesperson versus the gourmet salesperson, what's different today, the fast food salesperson knows the product that they're selling. You know, I sell bottled water uh, or, you know, I sell hammers. And, and so, you know, whatever the question is, the answer is I've got a hammer. Would you like to buy it? Uh, I think today those types of salespeople are in all kinds of trouble and they're not going to get in front of executives. The kinds of people that get in front of executives and that executives value are authentic problem solvers. So I am exploring an area of the business where I can help. I don't have only a, a hammer to sell. I create real solutions. And that means I have a toolbox. And there are several tools in the toolbox that I can configure in a way to solve your specific problem. Now, I, I, you know, in the business that I work in, where I'm helping organizations dramatically increase their sales and, and uh, we, or, well, what we really focus on is helping them win, keep and grow key accounts. I know specifically this is the area that we want to explore with our customers. So I'm going to listen very authentically. I'm going to take very good notes about what I'm hearing from the executive. And then I'm, we're going to craft a solution together. Now, in the envisioning part of this uh, dialogue framework, this is where I'm going to actually help them craft a solution. So when I say, you know, could you paint a picture for me of what the ideal solution would look like as they're painting the picture? So we have a blank canvas. And as they start painting the picture, I'm going to say, and what about and, and would you think this would be helpful? So I'm actually going to participate in the painting of that picture. But it is a very authentic uh, discovery process. And executives are not stupid. They can smell, they can detect when they're being manipulated. You know, we're not, we're yeah. not there to manipulate them. We're, we are actually there to really get in, understand, and, uh, and explore with them how we can help. Having said all of that, though, I've got my toolbox. I know what's in my toolbox. 
the creativity comes in configuring the different tools in my toolbox to solve a very specific problem. And at the end of this conversation, it is entirely possible that I say to this executive, I don't think we can help you now. You know, and, and so if we if we walk in with this sort of desperation that no matter what happens, I have to sell this person something, it's not going to be a healthy conversation. Instead, I want to show up authentically there to help. And I actually should be able to engage in conversation in such a way that the sale, the, the executive is selling me on why I should work with them. And that's that's wonderful when you start hearing them sort of trying to convince you of how great a company they are to work with. And they're selling you on how you should help them. That's that's where really where you want to get to. Makes total sense. I want to come back to an example that I've had in the past of selling medical devices to the NHS and dealing with senior procurement officers I felt comfortable with. And then when I got into the realm of CFOs, I I just felt uncomfortable. So I want to come back to that example in a second. But as, as we're down this flow, I want to continue. And you mentioned something which is really important here, which I don't think we've ever really talked about on the show before. So I think there's value in this. And that is, you said that you make notes so that then you can craft a solution for them after the fact. What do your notes look like when you are in a meeting with a member of the C-suite and you, you're having the discovery questions, you're going back and forth, you're going through uh, the process you just described there, Adrian. What do your notes look like at the end of that? And then how do you process them? And then what's the end result with them? Brilliant. Well, first of all, my notes always look like chicken scratch. <laughs> I think uh, I should have been a doctor the way the way my handwriting looks. Uh, but my notes are, are free form. Um, I, I used to try, I was trying, there was a point where I was trying to be completely digital. I'd walk in with my iPad and try to type as I go because ultimately everything's going in. My CRM is Salesforce. Everything's going in uh, Salesforce. But uh, with executives, this is not cool. Uh, executives don't, this is not executive behavior. And, and it's very important that when we're meeting with executives, it's peer to peer. And so an executive will have a, a, a notebook and a pen uh, and they'll take notes and I'll have my notebook and pen and I'll take notes. I tend to take a lot of good notes. I tend to take good notes. Uh, I'm a quick writer and that's why my writing is not neat. Um, and so I'll just capture what I'm hearing, the essential things I'm hearing. And what what is essential? Are you capturing, I just want it, because I think this is really, I think this could potentially be really value for the, valuable for the audience. Are you capturing a quote of, you know, you're looking for quotes that you can almost verbatim say, you said that this would be a great solution and things like that. Or are you looking for numbers, data, or, you know, what, what are you trying to pull from the conversation? So a couple of the fundamental thing that I'm trying to pull from the conversation are what are this executive's goals? What is what is what is the gap between where they are and where they're trying to get to? And this has a lot to do with emotional intelligence. Uh, what we understand today, you know, years ago, I don't know if you're um, uh, as old as I am. <laughs> I, I grew up with Star Trek, uh, Captain Kirk and Spock and all that, right? Uh, and and the logic then was that, or the thinking then was that. You know, if we could only get rid of our emotions, then we could think clearly and rationally like Spock. And so Spock always made the best decisions because he was not plagued by emotion, unlike the mere humans who their emotions would trip them up. Uh, that thinking has been completely debunked by modern science. The modern neuroscience is showing that emotions and logic are not separate. They are completely intertwined. And that in fact, it is emotions that energize and fuel our logical thinking. So there really is no thinking without the foundation of emotional engagement. Further, what we understand now is that emotions are triggered by goals. It is because we have goals that we have this emotional subroutine or a set of emotional subroutines that run as a result of us having goals. And, and the two fundamental emotions that run are fear and desire. And all of our other emotions are really uh, subsidiary to fear and desire. We either, uh, we, we want something and we fear losing it. And, and all of our emotions trigger from this. So when I, what I'm really listening for fundamentally are what are you trying to accomplish and what's getting in the way? Because if I can uncover that, I have the keys to your emotional engagement and I can now speak into your goals and I and I can I, I already know the emotional subroutines that are going to run because these subroutines are involuntary. It doesn't matter whether the goal is to climb Mount Everest or the goal is to get par on a golf course. Uh, the goal is to uh, retire at 55. It doesn't matter. 
these subroutines just run automatically. So once I know what your goals are, I have the keys to your emotional, uh, your emotional energy. Uh, and I can trigger both positive and negative energy depending on how I tap into the goal. So that's the number one thing I'm listening for. I'm also listening to for metaphors. When people say things like, you know, this is a very deep groove that runs through our corporation. I have no idea what that means, but you just use the metaphor. You know, really, you just use the metaphor. I'm going to capture that. Why? Because I'm going to speak that back to you. Because within your organization, that is shorthand for a whole bunch of uh, emotional hot buttons. And so often when I, well, I call this the controlling metaphor, I'm listening for the controlling metaphor, the metaphor that sort of encaptures everything that they're facing in a few words, in a simple image. And, and often I will, I will entitle my proposal back to them using that metaphor. Uh, and that, that just goes straight to the, the uh, emotional brain and it, just, it, it has deep emotional resonance for them. I am also listening for, you mentioned facts and figures, um, usually at this level, I'm, I'm listening more for the metrics that matter to this executive. What are the metrics that they're trying? What, what are the metrics that they're trying to move? How do they measure their success? As we go deeper into discovery with other stakeholders, that's where I'm really focusing now on the facts and figures to justify the investment. But uh, at this level, I'm just listening for what are the key metrics? Where are they now? What do they? What what should they be? Amazing. I'm so glad I asked that question because we went so deep there in that past five minutes. That was amazing. So, and let me paraphrase this and tell me if there's anything that I've missed. So we gather all that data or, you know, my writing is as terrible as yours from the sound of things. So then it spends, I take 20 minutes trying to read um, and understand what I wrote 15 minutes ago. Um, but then we use that to put together a proposal and perhaps we can touch on proposals, but I don't want to dwell on it because that could be a whole topic on itself. But we're looking for a proposal that includes metaphors. We're looking for a proposal that includes not just random data that perhaps an end user would get excited about, but metrics that matter to that individual that move them closer to the goal that then essentially we can repeat back to them. You said your goal was this. This is the metrics that will help you get there. The problem is solved. And so it essentially becomes a no brainer to do business with you. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And so uh, the proposal, the negotiation, um, any presentations, everything has to be hung on the strategic goal of the organization. What, what is it they're trying to achieve? What are the key initiatives? What's getting in the way? How can we help them remove some of these obstacles to help them get to their goal faster? And what are the metrics that are going to move so that we know that we've actually succeeded together? Perfect. And this 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 has very uh, you know exec the, the thing about uh, selling to executives is uh, number one we have to understand everybody's emotional even the guys who come across or, or the men and women who come across is very logical uh, fundamentally we're all emotional we have these emotional subroutines that run involuntarily uh, so that's really critical to understand because of that and the 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 position that these people hold they can make decisions. Ra you know, very, very rapidly. In fact, uh, you know, years ago, I didn't understand this, but uh, I was selling uh, billing systems and uh, these were uh, mission critical systems. They were all around internet billing versus legacy telephone, uh, old telephone system billing. And, and so uh, we were doing some pretty significant deals because it was mission critical. Uh, now, I had a partner call me and tell me about a, a, a customer that uh, of theirs that was about to make a billing system decision and, and we needed to get in there. So I called the CIO, which was usually our uh, port of entry uh, within these organizations. And he basically said to me, not interested, that uh, they've already made their decision and uh, thanks, but no thanks. And I tried and I begged and I pleaded and he just wouldn't engage. And so I had nothing to lose. I called the CEO and uh, managed to connect with her and said to her, you guys are on the brink of making a multi-million dollar decision. Uh, we are one of the leading companies in this industry and we've never had a conversation with you. All we would like is a conversation to share with you why other organizations are investing with us rather than the people that you're looking at. She granted the meeting. I had about half an hour with her and uh, the VP of marketing came to that meeting as well. And one of the things I did that I discovered afterwards the power of is, is I just told her the story of what we did with their counterpart in the U.S. 
and how successful we were with her counterpart in the U.S. This was, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't mention the company name, but... Uh, <laughs> the, the, there's uh, no one else. There's only 20,000 people that are listening <laughs> to this as well. So, you know, we, we shared with them what we did in the U.S. And she was intrigued and basically put, a, put the brakes on the purchasing decision that they were at the 11th hour about to make. She put the brakes on it. Long story short, uh, the CIO got fired. We won this business. It was a $4 million deal. Looking back, I realized she purchased, she spent that $4 million in that 30 minute meeting and on the strength of the story that I told her. And, and basically everything that happened after that was just to validate her decision that she, she made in that meeting. And so when we engage executives emotionally, uh, they will make snap decisions that just feel right. And then they will work afterwards to make the decision actually come to pass. And so purchasing is often, purchasing decisions are made very quickly while the sales effort might go on for six months or three months or even nine or 12 months. Uh, but we need to understand how people buy more than how we sell. And, and, and then what we're often doing is protecting a purchase decision that they've already made rather than actually trying to make a sale. Got it, got it. Okay, so Adrian, I want you to, um, it may be a while ago that you felt like this, but for me, it was say four years ago, I was flung in the deep end in medical device sales and, and rightly so and did well from it and <laughs> learned quickly uh, as I had to, otherwise I was going to get sacked as simple as that. But I spent, you know, so before that was in chemical, chemical sales, I was selling chemical catalysts to the pharmaceutical industry and I was not really dealing with anyone other than engineers, kind of end users, the company I was working for was the, the biggest and best in the industry. People wanted to buy from them because it was involving precious metals and there was crazy quantities of, of cash being flung around. And so there was only real one, really one option because they owned all the mines and everything else. Uh, I would say um, the company called Johnson Mathe, it's the, it's, the biggest, it's the biggest company that no one's ever heard of. That's the way I describe them. Um, so I went from dealing with end users pretty much over the phone from an office to walking into a uh, CFO in the NHS, walking into their office and having nothing in common with them whatsoever. How does one get over, I guess, the mental hurdle from someone who's, who feels like they're inexperienced, perhaps feels like they're, they're playing the, with the big boys here when they don't feel ready for it? Is there a way to break past that kind of mental barrier from our perspective so that we can serve and and you know help and add value in those conversations because i just know there's a lot of listeners who are either new to sales or perhaps are taking that step up into that bigger complex role where they're going to be dealing with c-suite that perhaps they haven't done before so is there is there a way to other than listening to um some like motivational hip-hop music in the car before you go into the meeting is there a way to get ourselves mentally prepared to have a conversation on the same level as these individuals? Yeah, and I think this is a really important question, Will, because all of us, regardless of uh, where we are, as we move up and try to perform at a higher level, uh, the biggest challenge we have is the mental game that we're playing with ourselves and the story that we're telling to ourselves. And so everybody can kind of get comfortable, regardless of what level you're selling at, but to try to then move to the next level, you know, even though our bigger customers or whatever it is, there's always a next level that we can get to higher levels of uh, personal income that we might be trying to generate. Uh, there is this um, the way that the brain works that it says, hey, we're comfortable here. Don't rock the boat. And as you try to break through to the next level, there's a sort of a panic that kicks in that wants to pull everything back and keep things the way they are. Um, so I think this is a really important question. Uh, number one, what I, and, and, and the other thing, the other part of this is. Um, executives who are powerful want to meet with others who are powerful. You know, a powerful person doesn't want to meet with a weakling. And, and the minute that they sense that you're, you know, you or I, when we show up, we're really not, we, we don't belong there, uh, that's the last meeting we'll have with them. Uh, so I think it's going to be important for us to, first of all, do our homework. Uh, so do your homework on the organization. Uh, do your homework on the industry. And, and this is something that I like to explain to salespeople is the best strategist, whoever this, let's say we're meeting with the CEO and this person is a highly strategic, really good thinker. Uh, the best strategist is vulnerable to lack of information. And so 
what we can do is really do our homework around the trends. How, what, what is happening external to the organization? And, and we live in such a fast changing world now, Will, that uh, you know, tomorrow is going to be very different than today. Uh, you know, next year will be very different than this year. And so being uh, really up on how, what, what, what's happening, for example, artificial intelligence, all of a sudden it's here. You know, a couple of years ago, nobody was really talking about this. All of a sudden it's everywhere. And if you're selling to an organization like Salesforce, uh, they're, they're gonna be trying to understand which way is artificial intelligence going, what's going on. Uh, so if we can show up with external information that's going to be helpful to this CEO. That is incredible in terms of um, leveling the playing field. That they they know their organization, but we're on the outside and we're interacting with multiple people in different industries, and we're aware of some things that are happening externally that can be beneficial to them. So I think that's a, another important thing that we can do. I, let and me then, just stop here a second because this is yes. genius. So. If I was competing with someone who had maybe not twice the age, but has twice the years in medical device selling, knows the surgeons better, perhaps knows the equipment better because they've seen it develop over that period of time, a, a level uh, between you and uh, that you and the more experienced sales professional, you know, as you're going into these meetings, it's going to tender the same multiple individuals, is thus the the kind of the the up to the moment leading edge insights on things, and that is something that you can have over someone who has just been doing the job longer, right? That, that is something that you can pick up, a, not in an instant. It takes a bit of work. It takes your homework to get it right. But that's something that you can own. That Exactly. And I love that word, you can own. You can own it. Exactly. Exactly right. That, that you got it. The third thing I was going to say is um, really having this attitude of service. We are not here to sell. We're here to help. We're here to solve problems. And so when I'm meeting with somebody, it's not like, you know, I'm this lowly vendor and I'm hoping to squeeze a few dollars out of your wallet. It's no, I have an organization behind me that is very creative, has a very strong work ethic, uh, and that solves real problems for people in this industry with these types of challenges. And now I'm here meeting with you. So I'm here to meet with you, to listen to you, to see how I can help. And I really like to believe in what we call the doctor frame. So I, I'm gonna before I go into that meeting, I'm gonna make sure I put on this doctor frame that I'm 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 coming into this conversation as a doctor, and so you have certain challenges. I want to listen to what those challenges are before I prescribe anything. So I need to do a diagnosis. Once I've done my diagnosis, I will then tell you what I prescribe, and and as the doctor, I'm gonna now share with you how this is gonna work. So let me share with you, Will how we do this, how we work with companies like yours. This is what we do. And so I think this is a real leveler as well. You're the patient who's sick. So I don't want you coming in, bur bursting into my office and telling me you're sick and here are the drugs that I must prescribe for you. Uh, this is malpractice, you know, this is not what I'm gonna do. So I'm glad you're here, have a seat, let's talk, and I'm gonna ask you a series of questions so that I can understand, you, you know, yes, you have these symptoms, but let's not jump to conclusions about what the problem is. Let's explore the symptoms. I'm going to ask you some other intelligent questions. And based on the questions I ask you, I'm going to come up with a, a diagnosis. And then I'm going to come up with a prescription. And that prescription is my prescription. I get to write the prescription. So I'm going to share with you, okay, I've, this is what I've heard. Now, this is how we work. And I think this is also the, a, a great way of the salesperson having the right frame of mind that you're meeting with somebody, not to sell them anything, you're there to meet with them, to listen to them, to diagnose what's going on, and then to creatively help them solve their problem. But because you're the doctor, you get to lead. And, and, and the other thing that a lot of salespeople don't realize, Will, is that this is amazing. The more senior you go in an organization, the more they want to be told what to do. And I think that I need to say that again. The more senior you go in an organization, the more the executive wants to be told what to do. They don't appreciate it when people come into their office and just dump problems on them. What they're looking for is somebody to say, you know, here's the problem, but this is what I want to do. And then they don't want to make sure, is that, have you thought about this? Great, let's get that done. So, and, but here's, well, what do you need from me? Well, I need you to do this, this, and this. Fantastic, you've got it, go. Uh, so I think that uh, realizing that if you have that clarity of purpose, 
uh, and you can be very clear about what the executive should do next. Okay, we've had this meeting. Here's what I want to do next. I would like you to set up a meeting for me with these people. I'll go and I'll meet with them. Once I have a better understanding of what's happening in these functional areas, I'll come back to you. Then you and I can sit down together and this is what we'll do. They love that. They love that sense of direction and leadership. And that's, again, where they're going to look at you as a guy that can make things happen, as opposed to somebody who's just sort of waiting for direction. Love it. Makes total sense. I think that's a great point to wrap up the show with. The, and I know from my perspective, the higher and higher up the food chains I go with the organizations I work with now, exactly how you describe, they want a solution. They don't want someone to just dig up a problem and then leave it as you described on their desk in front of them which is what i was kind of doing at first with the ad sales for the podcast of hey i've got this huge audience i can put you in front of the audience and then i would wait for a response now i will create a proposal ahead of time that shows the roi that people are getting right now the new customers that are being onboarded the benefits of the long-term relationship and how that kind of gets cheaper over the time as the show grows and the audience gets bigger and all the strategic side of things that, uh, again, I, I'm now including that before I was just, hey, I've got a big audience trying to be in front of it. And the response was always, well, I need you to do a bit more work before you come back to me and take any of my time. And it was uh, it was <laughs> certainly by fluke that the coming up with a proposal and, and, and data and numbers. But as you said before, metaphors from conversations and things like that would just turbocharge the results of them. So with that, Adrian, I love that uh, to turbocharge the results. Exactly right. <laughs> Adrian, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show, mate. And that is, and we'll wrap up with this. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I would say if I, if I think of myself personally, um, I was very much a perfectionist. You know, if it's going to be done properly, I have to do it myself. And I think looking back, I mean, I made a tremendous amount of money. But looking back, I think I could have done even far greater if I leveraged myself. And, you know, a guy at my level and certainly some of the people that are listening to this, you know, at the end of the month, filling out, for example, expense claims. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, it's better to get a virtual assistant and, and surround yourself with people who can look after things for you so that you can focus your time on the high value add activities that really only you can do. That's what I would say is uh, really figure out what are the value add activities that are critical for you to do and, and hire some virtual assistants and get help and team members to do the other things. Love it, I love it. We could probably dive into this further, but I'm conscious of time, but just for the audience, um, they've probably seen me mention this over the past few months, but now we have a virtual team of six working uh, to help put out more content, better content for the show. And I had the realization that essentially you just described of I was doing all kinds of crap that I shouldn't have been doing. And my time, my what the business runs on is these interviews. So if I could take away the time that I was writing show notes, the time that I was writing, you know, there's obviously value in me writing some articles, but a lot of the time now I have a ghostwriter structure it. I go in and add my own kind of like twist on it, rewrite it a couple of times. And that means I can about even you know, if I spend the same amount of time doing it, I can do two or three more articles than what I could do. And this is a huge shift for me because I've never managed anyone. Um, but I think the virtual assistants for sales professionals, especially those that are getting higher up and doing bigger deals and are still doing, you know, the mileage reports at the end of the month and their their expenses and, and documenting how many times they went to McDonald's um, kind of to get lunch. It's ridiculous. And I think that's going to become more and more prevalent over time. So with that, Adrian... Tell us a little bit where we can find out more about yourself, your website, um, you know, mention the book, and then I believe you got a resource for us as well. Yeah, actually, a couple of resources. So adriandavis.com, A-D-R-I-A-N, adriandavis.com is the website. Uh, email adrian at adriandavis.com. And I think if anybody wants, I've got a, several resources, uh, proposal template, storytelling template, question library, uh, customer selection uh, tool. There's a number of things. Uh, email me adrian at adriandavis.com. Uh, we can just set up a quick 30-minute uh, consultation. I'll just learn a little bit about your business, tell you how to use these resources. And uh, the book, Human to Human Selling, is available on Amazon.com. Amazing. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes of this episode of salesmanpodcast.com. And with that, Adrian, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your insights. I want to... Um... I, I almost want to give myself a little pat on the back for some of the questions of diving digger, diving deeper than what I wanted to uh, when we first started the show because they led to the best answers. The notes 
part of this i think could you be a whole show in itself and i really i personally got a lot of value out of that so i appreciate that mate cool i gotta tell you you're a wonderful <laughs> interviewer you're, you're you're really are and you said it this is what your focus is get other people do the other stuff i think you're fantastic i, I, I wasn't trying to bait a uh, compliment off you there but i'll take it and with that i want to thank you for joining us on the salesman podcast thanks so much 